And good evening. Tonight, former President Trump caught in a balancing act between the courthouse and the campaign trail once again. The judge in Trump's hush money case handing him a legal win, delaying his sentencing until after the presidential election. That sentencing was originally scheduled for less than two weeks from now on September 18th. It is now expected to take place three weeks after the election on November 26th. Judge Juan Mershon handing down a written decision, reading in part, this is not a decision that this court makes lightly, but it is the decision which is the court's view best advances the interests of justice. That ruling coming on the same day that former pre the former president was back in a New York courtroom fighting a different case. His lawyers fighting to overturn the first E. Jean Carroll verdict, which found him liable for sexual abuse and defamation. Following his court appearance, Trump held an hour-long news conference railing against Carroll and even criticizing his own legal team. Her favorite show is Law & Order. And there's an almost exact story as her story in Law & Order about being attacked in the dressing room of a department. So I'm disappointed in my legal talent, I'll be honest with you. So what does the road ahead look like as the former president faces his own legal battles and an election rapidly approaching? NBC's senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett, starts us off tonight. Tonight, a seismic legal victory for former President Trump, the gift of time. The judge overseeing Mr. Trump's criminal hush money trial in Manhattan calling off his sentencing that had been scheduled for September 18th, saying the case is one that stands alone in a unique place in this nation's history. Judge Juan Mershon, who Mr. Trump has repeatedly blasted as politically biased against him, now pushing that sentencing to November 26, three weeks after Election Day. Mershon saying today the public's confidence in the integrity of our judicial system demands a sentencing hearing that is entirely focused on the verdict of the jury, adding it must be free from distraction or distortion. A jury convicted Mr. Trump of falsifying his business records in May, but his defense team has pushed to delay any sentencing, ensuring his felony convictions stay out of the headlines as early voting begins. Uh, that case is a disgrace. It should have never been allowed. I did nothing wrong. Earlier, the GOP nominee railing against his legal cases. And my poll numbers, I believe, are higher now than they would have been without it because the public understands it's a hoax, it's a scam, it's a political witch hunt. Even taking a swipe at his own defense team. I have all this legal talent, but legal talent cannot overcome rigged judges. They can't overcome a 4% Republican area. And I'm disappointed in my legal talent, I'll be honest with you. They're good, they're good people. But his primary target today, the women who have made accusations against him in the past, including Jessica Leeds, who said Mr. Trump groped her on an airplane in the 1970s. I'm famous. I'm in a plane. People are coming into the plane. And I'm looking at a woman and I grab her and I start kissing her and making out with her. What are the chances of that happening? I know you're going to say it's a terrible thing to say, but... It couldn't have happened. It didn't happen. And she would not have been the chosen one. She would not have been the chosen one. Leeds' accusation resurfacing as a federal appeals court today examined whether a jury improperly considered it in finding Mr. Trump liable for sexual abuse and defamation of another woman, writer E. Jean Carroll, awarding her $5 million. It's an appeal of uh, a ridiculous verdict of a woman I have never met. Okay, Laura Jarrett joins us in studio. So, Laura, I know it was in your report, but explain the judge's thinking here a little more. And was this a surprise? I think part of the issue is this is a judge who has been accused uh, of being a Democratic operative based off of his $35 donations. And I think that he realized that anything he does now is politically fraught. And so he chose between uh, two options. He's damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. And so why not just go ahead and do it after the election, given where we are in the calendar? So he cited the election in his decision, right? Mm -hmm. 
I guess my question is, why did he think it was okay to try the case during the election, but it's not okay to sentence during the it's election? A, it's a great question. Remember, though, the sentencing was supposed to happen a long time ago. He originally had it set for July, then it kept getting pushed, then the Supreme Court drops a bomb with the immunity decision, and so the defense is using that as sort of a leverage point to go to every court that they can to say, look, he's now immune. And so, he, he, at least for this judge, he's saying, we didn't expect the Supreme Court to do this, and it's sort of changed change the game in every way. A lot of people watching this may, may ask themselves, okay, there's an election coming up. If Donald Trump wins the election, yes. what happens to all these court cases? What happens to this one? Uh, the real answer is we don't know because we've okay. never seen it before. I think the fact that he scheduled it three weeks after the election was probably sort of an acknowledgement that the votes might not be done by November 6th. And so he probably wanted to give himself a little bit of time to see where things shake out and for when the election is actually called. If the former president was to be reelected, in reality, that sentencing is probably going to get pushed again. If he is not reelected, however, I think that sentencing does go forward in November. And, and then if he is elected, can he pardon himself from these cases? I, I, yeah, so this is another thing where it just never happened before. I think there's right. fair arguments to be that that is not contemplated in the Constitution, but the Constitution also doesn't say that you can't pardon yourself. Because they're pretty broad, right? The, yes. The pardon power. Of We've course, about this, of yeah. course. But also, though, Tom, in reality, this, these were low-level felonies. It yeah. wasn't as if he was facing a long jail sentence. And then the Judge Marchand may not have even contemplated giving him prison time, for all we know. But for his ego, I mean, you know, and, and just to kind of clear the record, maybe, knowing knowing the former president. Don't could, could he do it? I, I don't have any reporting to suggest yeah. that that's the plan, but I do think if he's reelected, our whole scheme for how we look at these criminal cases is going to go away. I think they all drop away. If, if we're talking about the federal ones, yeah. he can dismiss or fire them, and the state ones, they're just not going to go forward if he's president. Let me ask you, though, with, when the, the cases like from Letitia James that concern his business yes. and getting sued by E. Jean Those Carroll. are still live. Those he can, that, that is, that's outside the purview. They're pardon, outside right? the okay. purview and they're still live. A lot of them still tied up on appeal, but there is a hearing in a couple weeks as he's trying to challenge that massive verdict on the civil side. All right, Laura Jarrett leading us off here on Top Story. Laura, we always appreciate having you on. With only four days to their high stakes debate, former President Trump and Vice President Harris are preparing as a new polarizing issue takes over the campaign trail. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has this one. Tonight, with just four days before that highly anticipated debate, Vice President Harris is hunkered down in Pittsburgh, where she's expected to hold mock debate sessions through the weekend after getting new support from an unlikely source, a former Republican vice president. Dick Cheney will be voting for Kamala Harris. That announcement from former Republican congresswoman and frequent Trump critic Liz Cheney, who says she's also voting for Harris. One issue that's likely to come up in the debate, crime. Late today, former President Trump speaking to the world's largest organization of law enforcement, the Fraternal Order of Police, after getting its endorsement. Kamala Harris and the Radical Democrat Party have led a war on law enforcement in America. They're against you so strongly. While the Harris campaign today releasing this letter signed by dozens of law enforcement officials endorsing her. That comes as the issue of gun violence has once again rocked the country and the campaign following this week's mass shooting at a Georgia high school. Trump's running mate J.D. Vance calling for increased school security. The Kamala Harris answer to this is to take law-abiding American citizens' guns away from them. I don't like to admit this. I don't like that this is a fact of life. But if, you're, if you are a psycho and you want to make headlines, you realize that our schools are soft targets. And we have got to bolster security at our schools. The Harris campaign writing on social media, school shootings are not just a fact of life. It doesn't have to be this way. Vance then responding, instead of addressing her own failures, she lies about what I said. Gabe joins us tonight from the White House doing double duty campaign trail and the White House. Gabe, you mentioned that the vice president is in Pittsburgh on debate prep. Is that her entire weekend up until Tuesday or will she be doing some campaigning? Well, mostly, Tom. It will be her entire weekend. Her campaign says that it's possible she does a couple of informal stops in and around Pittsburgh, but most of her time will be taken up by debate prep. Now, you might ask the question, why spend so many days outside of D.C., outside of, or, you know, outside of uh, this area and go to a battleground state? Well, her campaign believes that could get her some media attention locally, and it allows her to really focus on that debate prep in a key battleground state where she can 
also make those informal stops and talk to voters, Tom. And then, Gabe, you know, we just saw former President Trump in New York holding that news conference. What is he doing in the lead up to the debate? Is he on the campaign trail? I mean, I know he's going back and forth about what type of prep he's actually doing. Well, yeah, and that's something you hear from the campaign a lot, right? Um, that he doesn't do any formal debate prep, that he just talks to his advisors really informally, calls people up, and that's what they say he's going to continue to do. But uh, former President Trump will also hold a rally in Battleground, Wisconsin, tomorrow, Tom. Gabe Gutierrez on the campaign trail once again for us. Gabe, thank you. Now to Money Talks and the growing concerns over a slowing job market and the economy, a major issue in the upcoming election. Tonight, new numbers from August showing the creation of fewer jobs than expected. Last month, the U.S. adding 142,000 jobs. That number nearly 20,000 less than what economists had predicted. Today's report making an already bad week for the stock market even worse. The Dow Jones losing more than 400 points today, or 1%. Overall, this week, the Dow down nearly 3%. The S&P 500 hitting its lowest mark since March of 2023, dropping 4 Point three percent. The Nasdaq also seen its worst week since 2022, tumbling by 5.8 percent. All this coming ahead of a key meeting by the Fed later this month, expected to lower interest rates. What does it all mean? We threw a lot of numbers at you there. Christine Roman's here to calm us down. So, Christine, should we be worried? You know, I'm reading off all the stock market numbers, and yeah. you're down one, two, three percent. But worst week since March. Right. You're, just, you're wondering what's going on. I always like to preface this. I know you're the expert, not me. <laughs> but the stock market, at least the people in the stock market think they predict the future um, when, it, when it comes to the economy. So what do they see that maybe we don't? So some context about the stock market in particular. It went basically straight up until the beginning of August and it had a little flip. And then it went straight up until... It's been hot. And, 401ks right. have been hot. And then it, there are more 401k yeah. millionaires than ever before. Um, and you had a lot of this based in technology, the technology stocks coming back. That was a really, really frothy kind of a market. So, And this is also the time of year when people are looking into the end of the year. They're sort of rejiggering their portfolio. So I'm not freaked out yet. Um, and no one should really freak out about yeah. the stock market because over time, the stock market goes down. It's a great time to buy it. It goes back up. Right. Uh, talk to us about the other stuff, though, the employment, things right. like that. Okay, so the job situation. Another thing about the stock market, we're heading into this new phase where the Fed's going to begin cutting interest rates. The Fed will be cutting interest rates because it's trying to protect the job market. The job market is cooling. It is slowing a little bit. The Fed is cutting interest rates because it raised interest rates and kept them for so high for so long to, to kill inflation. Now the worry isn't inflation. The worry is the job market. When I look inside these numbers today, Tom, I think it's fascinating. If you didn't know what decade it was and you just said 4.2% unemployment rate, 142,000 net new jobs created. You'd be like, wow, that's pretty good. But we have a couple of months and months of gangbusters growth. And the worry is the job market can turn very quickly. The jo you know, the maybe quickly it right. can start to unravel. And that's what we're watching here. So is, is it a 0.5 that, that people are predicting, the interest rate cuts, or is it going to be a full point? What, what are they thinking? It's pretty much a quarter point is what A quarter point. Okay, sorry. It's way point. off. So a quarter point, is that already baked into what we're seeing in the stock market? I think it's baked it's in. It's baked in already? A quarter point okay. is baked in. And I think there's a there's some who'd like to see, in the bond market in particular, who'd like to see a half a point, that yeah. five. Um, but I think that might scare people because Fed Chief Jerome Powell yeah. likes to play it He's not, He doesn't like to be radical. Yeah. On that point, do we think anything radical is going to happen with the economy before the election? No. I mean, I, and I think if you look at gas prices are down 50 cents from a year ago and likely heading into Thanksgiving, they're going to be below $3 a gallon uh, nationwide, the average. Um, you're looking at mortgage rates already down two points, almost two points from the worst last year. So mortgage rates. Are, so there's these pain points for families that are starting to loosen up a little bit here. Um, and the only next big jobs number, or big data point we get is a CPI number. So I think we've got, we're, we're kind of, this, we're, we're, we're coasting into the election. All right, Christine Roman, it's always great to have you here. Christine, thank you. We're also following breaking news out of New York and Canada. The Department of Justice says a man has been arrested for plotting a terror attack on a Jewish center in Brooklyn on the anniversary of the October 7th attacks. The DOJ says the suspect was operating in support of ISIS. So let's get right to Valerie Castro, who joins us tonight. So Valerie, talk to me about what you know, first of all, and we're just getting the, the details, so walk us through this.
Yeah, Tom, this is all detailed in this 19-page criminal complaint that was unsealed just today by the Department of Justice. And in it, it names 20-year-old Mohammed Shazeb Khan as the alleged mastermind of this plot. He was a Pakistani national who has been living in Canada. He was arrested just a couple of days ago as he was making his way to the U.S. in order to start carrying out this plot. He was arrested just 12 miles from the U.S.-Canada border. The complaint says that he allegedly planned to carry out this attack in New York City. City. He had identified a Jewish uh, center in Brooklyn, and he was planning to use AR-style assault rifles and hunting knives to carry out this assault in the name of ISIS. The criminal complaint says he also identified two specific dates, October 7th, which is the one-year anniversary since the attack in Israel by Hamas, and he also identified October 11th, which is the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. The cr criminal complaint saying that he identified those dates as, quote, the best days for targeting the Jews. Tom. Wow, that is, that, that is so wild. Um, so you just went over the specific reasons. Do we know how they were able to stop him? Yes. Yeah, so the criminal complaint says that he actually began posting about his allegiance to ISIS last year, last November. He was posting about it on social media, on various, various messaging platforms, and he unknowingly began communicating with undercover law enforcement agents. He thought he had recruited uh, people to help him carry out this attack. He didn't know that they were undercover law enforcement. So he began detailing his plans. He began asking them to help him acquire weapons. He began telling them about uh, a an apartment that he would rent near the site that he had picked out. He told them when he was planning to come to the U.S. So when he made that move towards the border, Canadian authorities were alerted and they made that arrest. And now he is awaiting extradition here. Valerie Castro for us on that breaking news. Valerie, we thank you for that. Another breaking headline we're following this just in tonight. A person infected with bird flu had no known contact with animals. The CDC saying a man in Missouri was hospitalized with H5 bird flu in August, but has fully recovered. The CDC says it's the first case of H5 without a known exposure to a sick or infected animal in the U.S. Also, no H5 infections in dairy cattle have been reported in Missouri. However, the CDC says the risk to the general public still remains low. That's good to know. Okay, we're going to head overseas now to the occupied West Bank where Palestinian officials say an American woman was shot and killed by IDF soldiers while demonstrating at an anti-Israeli settlement protest. The White House now urging Israel's authorities to launch an investigation into the death. NBC foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has this one. Tonight, an American among the latest casualties of the Middle East conflict. The U.S. State Department confirming Aishunur Ezgi Egi, a 26-year-old Turkish-American activist, was killed in the West Bank. Eyewitnesses say she was shot by the IDF while participating in a protest near Nablus against expanding Israeli settlements. We came here and the um, peaceful demonstrations was violently um, oppressed by uh, tear gas, by, sun, by uh, live ammunition. Fellow activist Jonathan Pollack says Egi just arrived in the country on Tuesday and says he was there when she was shot. I heard uh, someone calling my name uh, in, in English saying, uh, we need help, help us. I put my hand under her head to try and stop the bleeding. Eggy was a recent graduate of the University of Washington. Nablus' governor turning his anger directly on President Biden. Biden, these American bullets that you sent to the Israeli occupation have killed your citizens. This is the third American killed in the West Bank this year. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. is still gathering information on today's shooting. I just want to extend my deepest condolences. We deplore this tragic loss. Israel's military said in a statement that soldiers responded with fire after people hurled rocks at them, saying the incident is under review. And with that, Matt Bradley joins us tonight from Tel Aviv. Matt, I know you have some new reporting about the IDF operation in Jenin, uh, another major city in the occupied West Bank. That's right, Tom. Now, that operation just wrapped up today in Janine, but in fact, that was part of a larger operation in the entire West Bank that lasted for 10 days. And the Palestinians said that killed 39 people. It was focused on Janine, which just wrapped up today, but earlier in Tolkarum in the El Farah refugee camp. This was a big, sprawling operation, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of folks here are saying it looks as though Israel is opening up a new theater of war in the West Bank. Tom.
All right, Matt Bradley for us tonight. Matt, we thank you for that. Okay, we're going to have much more in this show as we continue right here on Top Story tonight. Still ahead tonight, the teen and his father in custody after the deadly shooting at a Georgia high school. The two facing a judge for the first time today. What happened inside that courtroom? And the new audio when the father was asked about his son's online threats back in 2023. Plus, the attempted kidnapping in Orlando, a man accused of trying to shove a woman. You see it here in her own truck. A trunk, I should say, in a Walmart parking lot. How a purse strap may have saved her life. And if you want to visit Rome's Trevi Fountain, it might cost you the changes to limit tourists at the iconic landmark. Stay with us. Back now with the latest on that deadly shooting at Appalachia High School in Georgia. The 14-year-old accused of killing two students and two teachers, making his first appearance in a northern Georgia court today. His father appearing before that same judge shortly after, facing 14 charges in connection with the shooting. Our Priya Shreether has the details. Tonight, the 14-year-old charged in the deadly shooting at Appalachia High School, shackled with hair covering his face in his first court appearance. You were charged with four counts of felony murder. Family members of victims sitting in the first row. Soon after, his father, Colin Gray, appeared in the same courtroom. Are you Mr. Colin Gray? He's facing involuntary manslaughter and second-degree murder charges in connection with the shooting. These charges stem from Mr. Gray knowingly allowing his son, Colt, to possess a weapon. Two law enforcement sources familiar with the investigation tell NBC News that Colin Gray gave his son an AR-15 style rifle as a gift after they were interviewed by authorities last year following several anonymous tips that Colt made threats online. I don't know anything about him saying like that and I'm going to be mad as hell if he did and then all the guns will go away yeah. and they won't be accessible to him. He said he was shocked by the suggestion his son was making threats. Like, it's no joke. Well, we wouldn't be here if it was. No, I know. I know. And I'm telling you right now, we talk about it quite a bit. Okay. All the school shootings, things that happen. Yeah, all, scary. Hey, are you getting picked on at school? He is. He's getting picked on at school. And is everything okay? That's why I keep going up there. Court records suggest the suspect had a turbulent home life. Last year, his mother, Marcy, pleaded guilty to a family violence charge, and according to an arrest warrant, fentanyl was found in her car. But tonight, this community is focused on remembering the four lives lost. Students Christian Angulo and Mason Shermerhorn, and math teachers Christina Irami and Richard Aspinwall, known to many as Coach A. He saw something in me, and he just never let it go, ever. His former player, Quentin Hyde, says he became a coach because of him. Just knowing that impact he had on me, I want to have that impact on somebody. All right, Priya Shreeder joins us from Winder, Georgia. So Priya, could more charges be coming for both the alleged shooter and the father? Tom, this is so interesting. So the charges that the father is facing are four counts of involuntary manslaughter, two counts of second degree murder, and eight counts of cruelty to children. And those charges, the last one that I just mentioned, has to do with those nine victims who were shot. One of them was a teacher, but the other eight were children. So today, the district attorney here announced that the suspected teenage shooter could face additional charges in relation to those other gunshot victims because he said at the time that he uh, placed the charges on on the suspected teenage shooter, they didn't know the conditions of those additional victims, Tom. You know, Priya, I know you've been on this story from the get-go, and I'm, and I'm just really curious, what is that community saying about the news that was in your report that this young man allegedly was given an AR-15 after police came to his house concerned about threats and spoke to his father? Tom, simply put, they're absolutely furious. And it's going to be interesting to see in the days to come if having the father face these charges now is going to give them some sense of accountability or justice here. But numerous parents have told me that they're absolutely astonished that more wasn't done back in 2023 when the FBI was alerted through several anonymous tipsters through an online gaming platform that Colt Gray had already been making threats about conducting some sort of mass shooting like what occurred here on Wednesday. 
Wednesday. So they're very furious. They feel like more could be done. But when I spoke to the Barrow County Sheriff, he said, listen, the FBI did contact the right agency at the time. It's just that the Grays didn't live in this county. They had just moved here. And this was Colt Gray's second day of school at Appalachia High, Tom. You know, when this story first broke, Priya, there was a lot of concern also about all those that were injured. Uh, there, there was some reporting about stampedes early on. Do we know how those victims are doing in the extent of, of the injuries of the other people at the school? Absolutely. We do know that all of the nine other people who were shot by the alleged shooter are expected to make a full recovery. We know that eight of those people are students. One was a teacher. He was also a golf co uh, coach. He did go into some surgeries, but his daughter has posted on social media that he was in stable condition. And the sheriff also told us that several of those people have already been released from the hospital. And Tom, tonight there is actually, uh, you can probably tell it's raining here, but Despite that, there's a growing memorial happening at uh, the flagpole behind me in front of the high school, which is at half staff. So many people are coming with flowers to pay their respects to both the people who lost their lives and the people who were injured, Tom. Yeah, Priya, it was interesting. I know it was raining there behind you, and I could see all those people still walking to what that was. We now know it's a memorial. Uh, we thank you for pointing that out. Great reporting tonight on such a tough, tough story. When we come back, the sentencing for the man accused of killing notorious mob boss Whitey Bulger, the jail time he now faces six years after Bulger was found dead in his prison cell. Much more ahead. Stay with us. All right, back with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with police sentencing a former mafia hitman to 25 years in prison for killing the notorious Boston gangster James Whitey Bulger. Freddie Gase was uh, sentenced in a West Virginia federal court today after pleading guilty to voluntary manslaughter and assault charges. Prosecutors saying Gase used a lock attached to a belt to bludgeon Bulger to death in 2018. The assault happening just hours after the then 89-year-old Bulger was moved to a new prison. A woman escaping an attempted kidnapping in the parking lot of an Orlando Walmart. Check this out. Surveillance video showing the suspect coming up behind the victim as she was putting her groceries into her car. She told police the man tried to push her into her trunk at knife point and threatened to kill her. She escaped when the strap on her purse, which she was holding, broke. Police arresting suspect Juan Perez the following day. He was already on probation for a previous kidnapping charge. All right, funeral plans have been announced for the NHL player and his brother who were killed by an alleged drunk driver in New Jersey. Fans and teammates mourning the death of Columbus Blue Jackets player Johnny Gaudreau and his brother Matthew at a vigil in Ohio this week. Their funeral has been scheduled for Monday at a church in suburban Philadelphia. The suspect charged with killing them is still in jail, awaiting his next court appearance. And overseas Rome, considering limiting tourist access to the famed Trevi Fountain. Can you believe that? City officials proposing required reservations with fixed time slots and limiting the amount of people that can access the fountain steps. They're also suggesting an entry fee of about two euros for non-residents. Italy's capital expecting a major surge in tourism next year when it hosts the year-long Roman Catholic Jubilee expected to attract 32 million people. Okay, next tonight to the new tech revolutionizing 911 call centers right here in the United States. For years, emergency calls have been audio only, but now across the country, authorities are integrating a way for people to send video as well, and it's saving lives. NBC News' Kate Snow saw that technology in action in Pennsylvania. At Delaware County Emergency Services outside Philadelphia, Delaware County 911. Dispatchers can hear and see what's on the other end of a 911 call from a house fire. You see it? Yeah, that's the glowing behind that. To a car stuck in a creek. I see it. To a runaway thief. Is that this Tahoe sitting on the corner? Yes. Live video is changing the way dispatchers respond to an emergency. That has to be a game changer. It is. It makes all the difference in the world. Raquel Lewandowski has been a 911 call taker since 1994. When somebody on a landline called us, it would show us their phone number and who paid the bill. Now I have all this technology. Today, Raquel can get up to 60 calls during her 12-hour shift, mainly from cell phones. Stay on the phone with me. Do not hang up. Okay, is the baby still seizing? Through a platform called Prepared, Raquel can send callers a link asking them to allow video sharing and more. 
they're going to get a text message. It's going to say, it's Delaware County 911. Tap on this link to open. And when it opens it up, I'm not looking at them. I'm looking at what they're looking at on their phone. Like the time she helped a woman who was lost in the woods. She was scared because she was by herself in this park and it was dusk. I was walking the trail, but I got a little twisted up and I'm lost in here. I'm going to try sending you a link and it'll open up to me and I'll be able to see exactly where you are. And it should pinpoint on a map where you're at too. As soon as she opened, I could see the skyline in fear. So you kind of knew where I was. Kind of knew exactly where she was. And I start walking in the direction. Delaware County is one of the nearly 1,000 call centers across the country that have bought prepared. Beyond video, it uses artificial intelligence to transcribe a live call, make notes. Wait, Sarah? you didn't write that? No. The no. AI wrote, Mrs. Brennan has called 911 multiple times after slipping off her bed. She's waiting for assistance. And it translates if someone is speaking another language. I can imagine 10, 20 years ago, you they would hang up on me. They would get so frustrated, they would hang up on me. 26-year-old CEO Michael Chime started the company five years ago with two of his classmates at Yale. We created Prepared because 80-90% um, of 911 calls were coming from mobile devices in our pockets. But when people called 911, uh, the systems assumed that those calls were still uh, landline, that only audio was uh, available um, to help better understand what that person was going through. We all have cell phones. Why hasn't video calling to 911 been a thing? Yeah, I, I think um, for a long time, centers have wanted this, um, but really it's just been a very uh, challenge to get everyone moving around this idea. The technology, the infrastructure, um, the process, Video can change everything. Chime recounts a caller reporting domestic violence who turned on her camera. She says you're on stream with live with 911 uh, and the guy runs away. It was as if somebody was there before responders Just had. her holding the phone and saying yeah. I'm on with 911. Yeah, video. exactly. Yeah. And sharing video is about to get easier for iPhone users. Anyone with the newest Apple operating system who calls 911 in an area that has prepared will be able to click and share pictures and live video instantaneously without having to receive a link. You're going to demonstrate what a 911 call would look like on an iPhone now. Yes, yeah, so I'll call 911. Delaware County 911, dispatch 141. Where is your emergency? Hi, we're calling from the 911 center. Okay, I see that. I see device live video. I went ahead and hit it. Live stream will pop up, the notification. And you're just going to push the button? Yeah, I'll hit share. And then I'll have live stream. Perfect. I can see everything that you see. A recent survey found 82% of call centers nationwide are understaffed, leading to widespread burnout. It's overwhelming to know that you have such a responsibility to everyone in our county. If you have video and you can see what's happening, does that make it a little less stressful? Absolutely. Yeah, it's like um, having a car that is like you have all the bells and whistles. People with iPhones can now click and instantly have video to you. What will that mean? That's gonna be so much faster. Yeah. When so I what, say what faster, will that mean? it's only seconds, but for seconds for someone in my field is, is life changing. It means everything. On Monday, Apple's expected to officially announce the launch date for its new iPhones and operating system, iOS 18, it's called. Tech insiders say based on previous years, the release will likely come mid-September. Michael says they're hoping to work with other companies as well, like Google, so that Android phones could have that same way of clicking quickly and providing video right away. Tom. We thank you for watching Top Story all week. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Have a great weekend and stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.